That is our family. And it's our privilege to join them in the work that's being done throughout the world as our missionaries are spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And our, our privilege at this point, maybe not to go personally, but collectively we are to go. And we are to make disciples of all nations. And this time of year, we take up our offering, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering in order to support our missionaries. So let me encourage you again to be generous in your giving. They are representing us as part of the family of God and that we can support them and make sure that they're funded to continue to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, are you ready for Christmas? It's a week away. Are you ready? This morning, I want to share with you a gift that you can get God this year. You see, the time has come for God to bring the promised Messiah, his one and only son, the Savior, into the world. Now, I I think at this point when you understand the Messiah, the promised one, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, there has to be something spectacular planned for this event. The second person of the triune God, the creator of all things, the one who sustains all things, is coming into the world. There's nothing arbitrary going on here. Everything has to be just right. Is the census ready to go? Angels. How about an angry king? Herod, is he in place? Elizabeth, is she with child? Shepherds in the field? Light the star. Cue the angels. Let's go. Whoa, whoa, all of a sudden, stop. We need a couple parents. We need a couple parents. What do we have available? Just grab one. Grab one male, one female, those would be the... That's not how God did it. They were just not some random couple that God chose out of the world to parent his son. It's his son. These two were carefully chosen. It doesn't mean that they earned the privilege to do this, nor were they perfect. In just 12 years, after the family goes and worships in Jerusalem, the family heads home and they forgot their son. They weren't perfect. Could you imagine that trip back to Nazareth? And you forgot God's son? You're in big trouble. God help us, we lost your one and only. They didn't earn it, nor were they perfect. They were chosen. They were chosen, Let's, don't miss this. They were chosen because they were responsive to God. They were God-fearing, obedient, regardless to what was happening to them, around them, or inside of them. See, this pattern of obedience response did not earn them to be, earn them the right to be Jesus' parents, but it put them in the place to be used by God and to be useful to God. The same goes for you and me. Do you wanna be useful in your family? Do you wanna be useful in your church? Do you wanna be useful in this world? Useful to God? I do. But if you don't want to, you can check out now. Or you can stay tuned and hear what God did with two people who were responsive to him. Second Chronicles chapter 16 verse 9 says it this way. The eyes of Yahweh roam throughout the earth to show himself strong to those whose hearts are completely his. 
We're told in Luke chapter one, verse 26. In the sixth month, when Mary's relative Elizabeth is, is pregnant, she's in her sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came, came to her and said, greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. Then Mary asked the angel, how can this be since I have not had sexual relations with a man? And the angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her, for her who was called childless, for nothing will be impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. Now we go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. To Joseph. The birth of Jesus came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord to the prophet. See, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which is translated God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not have sexual relationships with her until she gave birth to a son. And he named him Jesus. Stay tuned, because God wants to use each and every one of us. And for that to happen, you and I have to put our Selves in the place where God can and will use us. He doesn't just use anybody, but he will use anybody who will make themselves useful to him. Let's join me in prayer. Father, it is a, a privilege and a blessing to be gathered here this morning in this place with your people and to know your desire to meet us here. As we gather, Father, we want you to be our welcomed guest. That Jesus would be honored and the Holy Spirit obeyed. That you would do a marvelous work in our lives as we surrender to you. And as Mary responded by saying, your servant, do to me as you please. Or Joseph as he awoke and did exactly as he was told. That our first response would be, when you speak, is to obey. 
Thank you, first of all, that you're gracious enough to speak to us. And thank you that you empower us to obey. With clarity through your word. With peace through your spirit. And with confirmation through circumstances. We will know that we are walking according to your will and your desire. Even when things become difficult, thank you that you keep us walking faithfully according to your will. And when we stray, thank you for your graciousness to touch our lives and to put us back on track. So I thank you for this day and reminder of what you want from us as we respond to your love with gratitude and obedience. Teach us this morning, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Obedience, not always one of our favorite topics. But I can guarantee you this, it's one of God's favorite topics. Number one, when are we gonna be obedient? Let me share with you, we can be obedient when circumstances seem impossible. When circumstances seem impossible. Now, one thing you and I will face is that when we do walk with God, we will be called to do things that are beyond human ability, number one. Beyond human ability. Mary asked the angel, when the angel said that the Holy Spirit would come upon you and that you were going to be with child, she was saying, how can this be since I have not had sexual relationship with a man? How does someone get pregnant without being with a man? This doesn't make sense. The two have to come together in in order for this to happen. And then he explained to her how it would happen. Mary, let me tell you what else has happened. In verse 36, consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who is called childless. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11, we were reminded about Sarah. By faith, even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age, since she considered that the one who had promised was faithful. And then in Genesis 18, 14, we read, is anything impossible for the Lord? Do you believe that? Is anything impossible for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will come back to you, and in about a year, she will have a son. You see, Mary knew. Mary knew what the, what the Bible said, the prediction that a, a virgin would be with child, would give birth to God's Messiah, that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. And she perceived by the angel's declaration that she was that virgin. But she couldn't imagine in what way this thing could be affected. And therefore, she proposed this question for the following reason. I've not been with a man. I haven't been Or do I have a husband? One thing circumstances will do. Circumstances can throw a long shadow on our lives. But we have a choice to shine in those shadows. Or be engulfed by its darkness. It was a bright, clear day. And Niagara Falls, the great Bundan, is going to make his way, type roping across Niagara Falls. Up on the wire he gets, he begins to balance himself with his pole. And across 
the roaring Niagara Falls, he walks on this tightrope to the other side. He gets to the other side, turns around, and he comes back. And then he points to the crowd and he says, do you believe that I could carry you across? Do you believe I could carry you across? Do you believe I could carry you across? And everyone was nodding. And then he asked, who wants to go across? And there were no takers, except this one young man said, I'll do it. And he climbed on Blunden's back and across Niagara Falls, the both of them walked. You see, a lot of people believe God can do things, but they just don't trust him to do so. Many are called, but few are chosen. Oftentimes, God is going to ask us to do something that's beyond human ability. And will we trust him to do it? So number two, we then believe God's ability. When it's beyond human ability, we believe in God's ability. Look at verse 37 again of Luke chapter 1. For nothing, now what does that mean? Nothing is impossible with God. And what was Mary's response? On your back I climb. I am the Lord's servant. May it be done to me according to your word. And then the angel left her. And then she runs into Elizabeth. In verse 45. And Elizabeth claims these words. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill what he has spoken to her. Do you really believe that God will fulfill what he has spoken to you? And he's called us to climb on his back and trust him. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, Jesus, looking at his disciples, said this, With man, this is impossible. But with God, most things are possible. All things are possible. In chapter 1, verse 18, the birth of Jesus, of Matthew again, the birth of Jesus came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, she was discovered it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, the angel appeared to him and spoke to him in the dream and say, what has been conceived of Mary is of the Holy Spirit. Go ahead, take her as your wife. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, O oh Lord God, you yourself made the heavens and the earth by your great power and with your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. When God is at work, then belief or faith is involved and is completely necessary. It will not depend on you, but you must depend on him. You see, I can do that for myself. I can depend on the Lord. I can lead others to do the same thing. I can teach them to do it. I can set the example, but I cannot do it for anyone else. Each and every one of us has to trust God that he will do what he says he will. And then we climb on his back, trusting him. So not only are we obedient, number one, when circumstances seem impossible, but number two, when doing so is personally inconvenient. First thing I want you to see is when you have conflicted feelings. Conflicted feelings. Look at verse 18 of chapter one of the Gospel of Matthew. When we're told that the birth of Jesus came about this way, Mary, who was engaged, obviously, with Joseph, before they even came together, she was pregnant. Now, I'm assuming Joseph had some feelings when he discovered this. 
Gentlemen, would you have some feelings? Joseph did not want to disgrace her publicly. He loved Mary. The two of them were going to spend the rest of their lives together. They were going to be committed to each other. And now she's gone off and done this? I love Mary. I want to spend the rest of my life, but I can't spend the rest of my life with her like this. This is not what God wanted from us. But she's exactly who I want. I do want to spend the rest of my life, but I can't because I know what God's word says. Leviticus 20 verse 10 tells us that if a man commits adultery, if a woman commits adultery, they must be put to death. According to God's law, Mary deserved to be stoned from Joseph's perspective. She's pregnant and I didn't do it. He knows he didn't do it. He didn't know it was a miraculous conception. He knew it was not him. Could he have accused her of her immorality? Did she deserve stoning? No, I can't do that to her. How about a no-fault divorce, like in Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 5? I'll just get rid of her. Write her a certificate and let her move on. Let this world know that she was wrong. Now he's considering all these things. I love her. I want to spend the rest of my life with her. She's been immoral. She's been wrong. She's gone off and had a relationship with another man. God's word tells me she needs to die for being so disobedient. And all of these things are swirling in his head. No doubt his feelings are convicting, conflicting. Number two, he has compassion and faithfulness. He's going to be faithful to Mary and to God. And here's how he does it. Hey, listen to this. This is powerful. When you and I are going to be conflicted on the inside with our feelings, there's an opportunity for us to shine for God by letting him shine through us. So he decided in verse 19 of chapter one, that latter part says he decided to divorce her secretly. The Bible has no provision for divorcing your spouse secretly. After he considered all these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and says, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. What has been conceived of her is from God. And you call him Jesus, he will save his people from their sins. He obeyed the angel's message in the midst of conflicting feelings. Why? Because he had the right attitude of heart. When he heard God's message, his desire was to do what God said. Knowing that the angel spoke to him and it came from God, he obeyed. Here's what my heart is saying. Here is what I'm struggling with. But Lord, I want to be obedient to you and what you say I will follow through with. Regardless. You see, when selfishness seems so appropriate, Joseph trusted God. Oh, that's easy to preach, folks. The Pharisees preached it all the time. And Jesus said this about the Pharisees, do what they say, not what they do. Why? Because the Pharisees, it's all about them. They are preaching and teaching and living a way that focuses on them rather than on me. And Jesus said this to the Pharisees, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. 
You pay a tenth of mint, dill, and cumin, and yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These things should have been done without neglecting the other. Yeah, you should be tithing. You should be doing those things. But you've missed the most important part of the law. And that is justice, mercy, and faithfulness. This is how Joseph lived his life. With justice, mercy, and faithfulness. This was the kind of man that God wanted to raise his son. And that's the kind of man God today wants to raise sons and daughters. Joseph reflected God's character. And certainly someone who reflected God's character was the perfect human being that he could use to raise his son. Because he knew that character would be instilled in his son even though his son had the perfect character of God already in him. And this is what the son did. Not only was he a reflection of his holy father in heaven, but he was also a reflection of his earthly father, Joseph. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In Romans chapter 5, it says in verse 8, God proved his own love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In that same chapter, it says the law came along to multiply the trespasses. This is the holiness of God. The law reveals the holiness of God. And then the law reveals our miserable failures. It shows that we cannot be obedient to the holiness of God on our own. But we're sin multiplied, grace multiplied even more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace will reign through righteousness, resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then it tells us in Philippians chapter 2 verse 8, Jesus, Joseph's son, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Where did he get that from? Yes, his heavenly father, but his earthly father also. Even death on the cross. Mary was with child. And Joseph was going to pronounce no accusation against her. He was going to keep it quiet. put her away in silence. So that when people looked at him and her, they will say, Joseph, you impregnated her. Bad boy. And now you're abandoning her? Bad boy. See what Joseph did? He who did not sin in this took upon Mary's sins from his perspective and made them his. This was a man that God chose to raise his son who would die for the sins of the world, who would take upon your sins and my sins. He had a heavenly father, but he wanted a earthly father that reflected his same character. He would take the condemnation to shield her. She was wrong, but he would take the heat. His future was in jeopardy, and so was hers. Who would ever give their daughter to him? in the future or who would ever marry her good choice God good choice parents this is what 
what God's looking for. Those children you got are not yours. They're his children. He wants to save them and make them his. And guess what kind of dads and moms he wants? Yes, the same character that was found in Mary and Joseph, he continues to seek today to raise up children that will fear him. Joseph looked just like Jesus. And guess what? Jesus grew up to be just like his dad. So stop blaming your children, parents, and start being the parents God called you to be. Because your children are going to reflect you more than anybody else. Give them something to reflect upon as you respond to the Lord. The gift of obedience. In the midst of circumstances, when they're impossible, when doing so is personally inconvenient. And number three, when surrounded by opposing influence. First of all, the power of social pressure. You know the pressure that these two were under. You know the stares, the looks. These people already knew that this was Joseph's son. Isn't that when Jesus did the miracles and the teachings? Their proclamation was, isn't this Joseph's son? Those who didn't buy the Holy Spirit thing. They said, yeah, Joseph did it. Social pressure to keep us from doing what God wants us to do is powerful, but it does not have to be controlling. In Mark chapter 15, we see an example of this power of social pressure. In chapter 15 of the Gospel of Mark, verses 13 through 14, when the crowds were calling for Jesus' crucifixion, Pilate had every opportunity to turn and to set Jesus free. And again they shouted, crucify him. And Pilate said, why? What has he done wrong? And they shouted all the more, crucify him, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd. Wanting to satisfy the crowd. Then Moses asked Aaron in Exodus 32, what did these people do to you that you have led them into such a grave sin? Don't be enraged, my Lord, Aaron replied. You know these people are evil. They said to me, make gods for us who will go before us. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 10 through 15. My son, if sinners entice you, don't be persuaded. If they say, come with us, let's set an ambush and kill someone. Let's attack some innocent person just for fun. Let's swallow them alive like Sheol. Whole like the, those who go down to the pit. We'll find all kinds of valuable property and fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot with us and we'll all share the loot. My son, do not travel that road with them or set your foot on their path. Chapter four, verse 14. Keep off the path of the wicked. Don't proceed on the way of evil ones. Avoid it. Don't travel on it. Turn away from it and pass by it. The world around us is choosing to walk in a path that contradicts the path that God has called us to walk on. And it beckons us, and it pressures us, and it calls us, join us, we're having fun. Don't do it. Number two, the path of sacred privilege. 
In verse 24, the family members were criticizing Joseph. The neighbors were criticizing Joseph. The religious leaders were criticizing him and telling him what to do. And when the angel commanded him, when he knew that word came from God through that messenger, he married her. He married her! Despite what everyone else was telling him to do, even his own inward feelings, he married her. Paul said this about people in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 8, through glory, and guess what? People also dishonored me. Through slander, and good report, regarded as a deceiver, yet true. People have all kinds of things to say about us and to say about you. But what has God said? In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, don't fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, for I, for am I now trying to persuade people Persuade people or God? Or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Let me let, me let you in on a little secret here. You will never please people. They will today exalt you. And tomorrow, they'll insult you. In Acts chapter 5, verse 29, Peter said, we must obey God rather than people. This Christmas, you'll have somebody on your list that has everything. And what is it that you buy or get for that person who has everything. You scratch your head. What do I get the person who has everything? First of all, it's an assumption. They don't have everything. <laughs> what do you give God who does have everything? He created all things. All things are his. And everyone ultimately belongs to him. Everyone will give an account of their life to him. But one thing he does not have, even though it belongs to him and he wants it, is our obedience. He won't coerce you. He won't force you, but I'll guarantee you this, it's on his wish list. But it must be freely given. That's it. I'm done. In the midst of your circumstances, in the midst of internal conflict and in the midst of social pressure will you and I be obedient Jesus said if you love me you'll obey my commandments and Jesus said my father and I will join you in your heart, in your life, your family, your church, and wherever you go. See, it's a gift. And it's something you and I can freely offer to God. Will we be obedient to him regardless? Father, 
I thank you for reminding us this morning of that special couple you chose to be Jesus' parents. Of course, Lord, we know they weren't perfect. Yet they feared you with a reverence and a love to be obedient to you when you spoke to them. Lord, that same power that worked in those young parents' life, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that same power is in those of us who claim to be yours, whose lives have been transformed, who has been born again, And that as you speak, help us to turn off the voices around us and even within us so that we might hear you clearly and say yes. Do unto your servant as you have commanded. So this morning, We want to fulfill your wish list, demonstrating our love toward you. We give you our obedience. Perhaps there's someone here today who needs to surrender their lives to you. Lord, move them to do so. Whether it be the first time or a Christian who has been listening to things around them and have turned their ear from you. Yet this morning, want to return to you, Lord. Thank you that you're a loving, gracious Father who forgives us and restores us. May we turn to you this morning, trusting our lives completely to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.